Thank you, Michael. Um, as it's been mentioned, I served with Mike as co-chair of the uh, New Haven, Hartford, Springfield Rail and CT Fast Track Corridor Advisory Committee. And uh, we feel we've got both uh, sides of the state, north and, and south covered. And as I mentioned, it truly is a partnership of all the communities uh, along these two important uh, transit initiatives. Enfield is the northernmost Connecticut station on the commuter, commuter rail line. And uh, my town is already planning proactively to get ready for the expansion of commuter rail service and the establishment of a station sometime after 2016. I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, the first speakers in today's program who will uh, talk about connecting transit-oriented development to market opportunities, a national and regional perspective. Both were researchers and authors of the HUD-funded study, Market Analysis for Transit-Oriented Development in the Region's Bus, Rapid Transit, and Rail Corridors. I will introduce both speakers, they'll make their remarks, and we will provide an opportunity for questions at the end of their presentations. I will keep my introductions fairly brief. Uh, for more information on their background, please refer to the speaker biographies that are included in your meeting packet. First, I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Sujata Srivastava. Um, uh, Sujata is uh, a principal at Strategic Economics and a core staff member of the Center for Transit-Oriented Development. She specializes in economic development, real estate market analysis, and fiscal impact analysis with a particular focus on the economics of transit-oriented development and infill development. Ms. Rivasava has led the firm in developing new methodologies for estimating housing and employment demand near transit, as well as measuring fiscal and economic benefits of compact development. Her recent projects include a transit-oriented development market study for the Knowledge Corridor, an economic development plan for the East San Francisco Bay region, and a neighborhood economic revitalization strategy in New Orleans. As a core staff person for the Center for Transit-Oriented Development, Ms. Srivastava has conducted national research on transit-oriented development and recently authored two white papers for the Federal Transit Administration on the topic of transit and economic development. Welcome. And David McCarthy. David is Senior Project Manager, Connecticut Office, Jonathan Rose Companies. He has managed multiple mixed-income transit-oriented developments in Connecticut through all phases of the development process with particular expertise in development financing and feasibility analysis. He is a lead accredited professional. Mr. McCarthy is currently engaged in pre-development activities for two mixed-income transit-oriented developments in Connecticut, and his recent projects include Chamberlain Heights, 124-unit rehabilitation of public housing in Meriden, Connecticut, and Metro Green Residences, a 50-unit mixed-income transit-oriented development in Stamford, Connecticut. Mr. McCarthy has also, was also project manager of the market analysis for transit-oriented development in the region's bus rapid transit and rail corridors. So they'll make their presentations about 10.20. We'll come back for a question and answer session. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, I'm going to start by just sort of giving you a little introduction to who I am and the organizations that I work for. Um, I'm at an urban economics consulting firm in Berkeley, California, which is one of three organizations that makes up the Center for Transit Oriented Development, or CTOD. Um, and the partnership is really about research and best practices to help communities plan for and implement TD across the country. We have a lot of resources online, and at the end of the presentation, I'll give you some potential resources that might be helpful as, you know, that contain some of the material that I'll be presenting today. 
Um, my presentation is really going to start with just discussing some of the overall benefits of TUD to start the conversation and then provide some examples from some regions that we think are similar um, that have had some experience with TUD. Um, and then ha flowing from that, some of the recommendations that we have on some of the local strategies that can be pursued here and um, some concluding thoughts. So I think it's pretty clear that nationally transit expansions are happening, ridership is up, uh, there are lots of new transit projects planned across the country. This is a map that sort of summarizes some of the data that we have on the dollar amounts of new transit expansions, and it's pretty impressive. Not all of this is fully funded, of course, but these are the projects that are proposed, and it's virtually every state. A lot of that is being driven by something that I know this region has been discussing a lot, which is changing demographics. A lot of the new um, households and population changes that are happening are really creating a different type of um, context for thinking about what types of places people want to live in. There's a lot of data to support the fact that there's certain types of generations, certain types of households that are more likely to want to live in a walkable urban place that offers amenities. A lot of research and studies have been done that demonstrate that. Um, and that's something that a lot of regions are capitalizing on. And a lot of planners and policymakers are also seeing that there are some wider benefits that go along with compact development and TOD. I'm just going to talk about some of them. I don't, I don't want to spend all of my time describing the benefits. But one of the ones that I do want to highlight is the benefits to households. And the most quantifiable way to measure this is through the savings on transportation costs. So this graph is showing you, you know, what the average American family spends on transportation is about 19% of their budget. When you combine transportation and housing, that's about half of a household's budget. If you're able to locate that household in a location-efficient, transit-oriented place, their household spending on transportation could be 9%. Um, whereas if they're in a remote location, it can be up to 25% on transportation. So there's really tremendous impact that you can have just by locating people in their transit, which has a lot of equity implications as well, particularly for lower income households. The second thing I want to talk about is the reduced cost of doing business. So nationally, we have a database that looks at population and households and employment and transit um, for all the transit regions in the country. And we've measured the change in jobs near transit uh, for the most recent years we had available. And so there was an increase in the number of jobs near transit. So there is momentum happening near the, the station areas. Uh, what was most striking to me and was that there's certain sectors that have a higher propensity to be in air transit. And these are knowledge-based industries and education and medical industries. So there's certain types of firms that have a stronger association with transit locations. Um, a lot of them are more likely to benefit from being agglomerated, from having that knowledge spillover and the exchange of ideas happening in close proximity to each other. Um, their workforce also may prefer to be in a, a different type of context than the traditional suburban office. So those are certain things to think about for our region here too. And some of those benefits that we've been discussing can also translate into higher property values. And there's a lot of literature that really demonstrates this. Really, there's really a range depending on the location and the transit. But without a doubt, there is a positive relationship between transit access and property values. Um, and I know that, that speaker, speakers later on will be talking about value capture. And this is sort of the foundation of that thinking. Um, and finally, the, the last kind of thing I want to touch on is that there's a fiscal benefit to transit oriented development and compact development for local jurisdictions. Uh, we've been doing research with Smart Growth America recently that really and that resulted in a new report called Building Better Budgets, which I uh, recommend that you take a look at. It was released last month. 
but it really demonstrates that there are some concrete savings on infrastructure, um, on ongoing municipal uh, services, and uh, that it provides higher tax revenues, which is you're able to concentrate development in places that have existing capacity and in uh, higher density building types. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the corridors that I think are analogous um, to the BRT and REM corridors that are being planned here. And I, I'm going to talk about at the corridor scale, partly because I think this is the best scale at which you can really talk about um, development opportunities and recognize the fact that every station area is probably going to play a different role. Um, you're not expecting every station area to be 50% commercial development, 50% housing development. You're not expecting every station area to have five or six story buildings. So thinking about the quarter scale allows you the, the nuances between different types of places. Um, it allows you to really understand the value of the accessibility and the connections that you're making from place to place. And it also allows you to think about how you would prioritize and phase development along the corridor um, rather than expecting every place to transform um, at the same time. And there are also different types of corridors. There are some that are multi-destination corridors where you have lots of different employment centers that you're connecting. There are some that are commuter corridors, which are really the traditional, you know, suburb to city type corridors. And then there are the circulators or streetcar type corridors. You know, thinking about what, what type of access you are providing, then let's be a lot more realistic about the benefits that you can provide and the value that you can capture. For example, this is a slide that shows the analysis that we did for the Twin Cities on the Central Quarter, which connects downtown Minneapolis to downtown St. Paul. And these circles represent the different station areas along that corridor. And thinking about the different places along the corridor and thinking about prioritizing and phasing and the market conditions in each of these neighborhoods allowed us to then have a more nuanced understanding about what type of development would happen in which part of the corridor, uh, what was the market likely to deliver, and what was the timing of that. <laughs> this is sort of approach is what we use in Pittsburgh, um, and this regional study, I don't know, this is kind of hard to see, but the different colors sort of represent the types of places that we identified um, based on market characteristics based on existing conditions. So that the, the region could really think more strategically about how to deploy their resources. And I know David McCarthy will be showing some of the similar um, analysis that we did for the knowledge quarters. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking a little, I'm going to go through some of the uh, experiences with TD and some of the cities and regions that we have been working with and that doing research in. To the extent possible, I really tried to pick places that were, I think, similar in character, either because of their size, um, because of the types of industries that they have in place. Um, to the extent possible, we also tried to reflect the fact that there were some regions that had slower economic growth but we're still able to implement DOD successfully. So I didn't want to just pick places in California or Texas, and I really wanted to reflect places that have similar economic growth cycles. So, for example, here, this is a slide that sort of shows one of the things that the Knowledge Corridor region has is this really strong concentration of knowledge-based industries and a strong base of healthcare and education. Right, so this is really similar to some of the places that I'm going to be talking about, like Cleveland and Charlotte, which have also the same sort of concentration. Um, and a lot of the, cor the corridors are actually connecting up a lot of these employment, employment centers, much like some of these other regions. So some of the fundamentals are already there in terms of, in terms of the corridor types and what you're actually connecting up. So let's talk about what's actually been built along these three corridors because some of the stuff that's theoretical and I, I just want to show you what the market is actually delivering in these places. Um, the three corridors I'm going to talk about are the Hiawatha Line in Minneapolis, the Southeast Corridor in Denver, and the Blue Line in Charlotte. And I can give you a little bit more information about these later if you want to, if you want to dig a little deeper. But all of them are corridors that connect up a couple of different employment places. They have a lot of diversity of different types of neighborhoods. They're all light rail corridors, and they're all completed in the early 2000s. So 
for all these quarters, there's a tremendous amount of development that accompany the completion of the rail, ranging from six million to ten million square feet. What I think is interesting, though, is that the development wasn't uniformly spread out like peanut butter everywhere. Um, most of the development happened not just where you had vacant land or underutilized land. So I think the common perception for a lot of people is if you have capacity, therefore you have demand. Uh, but we know from experience that that's not the case. Um, most of the development actually happened in places that had strong employment centers or near the strong employment centers. A lot of the development happened in funky warehouse type buildings that were close to downtown from older industrial districts. Um, a lot of the development happened in neighborhoods that had strong land use planning and proactive efforts in place. Um, they put in a lot of the infrastructure to really unlock the market. But where development didn't happen as much was on these small fragmented sites that you often see on auto or on really large sites at the edge of a region. Um, and also, we, we found that it was less likely for older industrial parcels to convert uh, if they require a lot of the, um, remediation. Uh, so that's the case of those three corridors. I also want to talk about a BRT corridor. So that's what we have here. And the one I've selected is the Cleveland Health Line because I think it has a lot of um, things that you can learn from it. That BRT line opened in 2008. One of the things that's uh, very similar to your region is that it connects a lot of the educational and medical. It was sort of a combination of different things where they had the new BRT coming in, and then they also moved an existing red line stop so that it would more uh, connect up more to Case Western. Um, the universities and hospitals uh, expanded and modified their campuses to be more transit-oriented um, and to create more of a place. Um, the, there was also a rebranding effort um, in naming it, which anchor institutions, these institutions were very involved in creating. Um, and it it's resulted in a lot of new development, um, about $5 billion in new development along this line, but it wasn't that the new development led. It was the fact that these different institutions created an environment where that development was able to then be catalyzed. And some of it was subsidized. Um, and it was just an interesting combination of public, private, and, and nonprofit partnerships. So I think the major factors of, of, that I just want to highlight about how TAD happens are really driven by, obviously, what your real estate market is, but uh, it's also about the type of transit service that you're providing. So we really want to encourage people not to be so fixated on the bus versus rail conversation. We really want people to think about what's the quality of the service you're providing, and are you connecting the right types of places? Um, are you really getting people to their jobs? Um, and beyond the transit itself, what type of district are you creating in terms of walkability, um, access to bikes? Um, so it's nice to hear about the Sims Ferry story. Um, and also, you know, is, is there some strong planning and place making in place that you can really leverage that? And sometimes that may be led by uh, the cities, and sometimes it may be led by an institution or the private sector. So, um, in terms of strategies, I think. I'd like to start by talking about the fact that there's lots of different kinds of TADs. So a lot of times people have in mind a specific project from a specific place that they went to. So maybe they're thinking about um, Columbia Heights or something in, in the DC area. But we really want to encourage people to think about the fact that TAD has um, a lot of different implications, a lot of different building types, ranging from townhomes, something that might be a lot denser. And it's, it's really, it really depends on what your market context is. So a lot of times people think, well, the more density there is, the more profit there is for the developer. And they're going to make trillions of dollars the higher up they go. Um, but we know that that's not really the case in reality. It's actually more of a U curve. Um, often, the higher density product types are more expensive to build. 
Um, and if the market's not there, um, you're actually going to maybe create uh, an infeasible product type. So unless you go up to kind of these luxury tower type products. So I think there's this, this, you have to kind of be more nuanced in thinking about what types of densities are feasible. And also in thinking about what types of regulatory uh, framework you have in place. Sometimes simple things, well, simple in theory, and on a graph, maybe not simple politically, is removing some of those regulatory barriers. This is just an analysis that we did for us in California where, you know, there's a lot of resistance to going above three stories. But we were able to show that if they were able to think about a five-story building type, um, it would have a tremendous impact on their cost to revenue ratio and make a project much more feasible. Um, certain types of incentives can also make a really big difference. So this is uh, some work that we did in Houston, um, looking at different product types. And you know, what we're looking at is the residual land value or the return on investment. And what we saw there was that the, the higher density they went, the lower the, the land values or, or return was. But if they were able to put into place reduced parking ratios, those product types only became a lot more likely to happen. So those are the types of incentives that we look at. Um, and you know, I think we really want to emphasize the importance of public realm. So it's not very sexy to talk about things like landscape or sidewalk width, but we know that those also have a positive relationship to land values and to the, the likelihood that a developer will want to make a risk and invest in a particular type of a place. So I think just the final, my final words on this. Um, first, there is really not a single recipe for success. I think there's lots of different ways to approach this, um, and hopefully we've sort of highlighted the diversity of different strategies that are out there. Um, but I think just being able to have a plan that's actually based on market realities is an important first step. Um, I think visioning is wonderful, and it's great to have a vision that's futuristic and reimagining what your place will be like. But if you don't have some market context attached to that, it's going to be really difficult to deliver. Um, we want to also emphasize the importance of partnerships. And Dave will talk a little bit more about what we're thinking about for your region, but really engaging some of the other beneficiaries of TAD, um, not just the residents, but institutions and employers, can really make a big difference. Um, and then we, you know, we emphasize the fact that the value is actually a long-term proposition. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. So thinking about how those uh, fiscal benefits can be realized over the long term, how the property values can change over time, and how you can harness that um, in the long term is something that we, we've seen in a lot of different places. Um, and then I think um, probably the most important thing is to have a combination of um, political will along with the actual implementers that, you know, the people on the ground are actually building it. So, you know, we've seen this over and over again, but if you don't have a lot of leadership from the top saying this is what we want to do, it's really hard to get it done. So, finally, this resources. These are a lot of the resources that I've been using when I, when I put together this presentation. Um, some of it is tough publications. Um, we also did some work for the EPA on infrastructure financing that provides some tools for local governments to think about how to implement TD. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, looking at some of the fiscal arguments for why compact development might be the right strategy um, comes out of the building better budget support. So with that, I'm going to close. Thank you. Karen, I just wanted to, I'm your young people let people cry. I just wanted to know also that we have in the packet um, a uh, TOD um, library, we're calling it, and it's a reference to many of the publications that are available from the Center for Transit Oriented Development. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here. And uh, I'm going to build it very close to what Sujata talked about, but I'm going to focus more on our findings for your region specifically. Um, 
Jonathan was company's partner with the CTOD to uh, do the market analysis of the Knowledge Corridor, which was funded through the HUD Sustainable Communities Grant. And we've been working with Mary Ellen um, and Krog and uh, David Elvin and Pioneer Valley Planning Commission very closely on this project for the last year or so. Um, today, what I'm going to do is focus in, there's a lot of data that we developed as part of this analysis, but many of you have heard that presentation already, or you already know it. What I'm going to focus on instead are what were our strategic recommendations to help you uh, implement TOD in your communities, which I think you might find more interesting at this point in, in, the, um, in where we are. So um, we're going to start with some very basic key findings of, from the data to just set you up for the, the, the um, recommendations that follow. And those recommendations are broken into two main groups. First are the regional strategic recommendations, which are not station specific. They're really what can regional policymakers do to encourage TOD. And then the second is what can station area policymakers do in, in municipalities specifically to make TOD happen in their community. So one of the first findings, um, as Jata alluded to, is that um, the existing employment in the uh, bus rapid transit and rail corridors is already supportive of TOD. Uh, a lot, 60% or so of the employment is within the healthcare, um, edu educational, and knowledge based sectors. So that's a great base to start with because those are jobs that already want to be in your transit um, and you're putting the transit into places where they are already. Um, and what we found is that over the last 10 years, many of those sectors are growing. Although the overall Connecticut economy is pretty stagnant, the sectors, the healthcare, educational sectors are growing, and that's a good thing, and that is projected to uh, continue. So uh, we estimated that you know, over the next 25 years, within the, the whole knowledge quarter region, um, there could be a growth of 50,000 TOD supportive jobs. Um, again, 25 years is a long-term proposition, but if you can find a way to capture those jobs near the transit, it will create a great marketplace for um, TOD in your transit areas. Likewise, um, in the housing sector, uh, we found opportunity really in the multifamily housing sector at this point. Um, you can see on these uh, series of charts, uh, on the far right-hand side is the total number of permits issued over the last 10 years. And although the number has decreased significantly, the share of um, multifamily housing units uh, has been uh, decreasing as well. And what we think is that, um, however, the underlying demographics, which are on the left-hand side charts, indicate that there are opportunities for multifamily housing. Um, you can see on the top left-hand side that the number of families in this region has remained largely stable, while in that uh, single-family houses generally appeal more to families, and we've had a huge expansion of single-family houses. But the uh, number of single-person households has actually been growing quite a bit, but you haven't had that growth in multifamily housing. So the question is, why is that happening? And uh, if you look at the patterns of um, growth in the region, you see that multifamily housing, which is on the left-hand side, is very concentrated in just a few locations, whereas uh, single-family housing is more broadly built across the region. And um, we think that if multifamily housing were permitted in more locations, there probably would be more of it. So uh, our growth projections were that there could be, over the next 25 years, um, demand for 9,000 to 10 to 12,000 new TOD units. Um, and many of those would be multifamily units. Um, uh, this is the last data slide here. And it's really just to say that if you look at a three-mile radius around each station area, which is generally what developers think of as being a trade area that they'll draw most of their um, clients from, you see that uh, many of the towns, uh, this is just the rail stations, and then the, the fast track is shown as one area since it's a relatively small geography. Many of the towns have a large number of households who could afford 
a new multifamily unit in the station area. Um, it's as many as four to 5,000 in some locations, and for the CT Fast Track Corridor, it's 8,000 households. So there is capacity to afford new units. It's just about attracting that, those individuals to those locations. Um, so pivoting now to strategy, we're going to start first with the regional strategies. Um, we, we, the, the, the first kind of broad regional strategy is to develop, uh, is to direct state resources towards the station areas. Um, in many ways, the state spreads resources out all over the place at this point, and it's getting better about that. We've seen actually a remarkable improvement in the targeting of resources over the last number of years, but um, those resources could really start to create a market for TOD in your station areas. Um, we're going to look at four different areas, economic development resources, um, the, the decisions on where state offices are located, um, state financial assistance, which comes in many forms, and uh, MPO discretionary funds. So looking first at state uh, financial assistance, the data shows that a, a lot of state financial assistance goes to companies all over the place. Um, this is, this is uh, state subsidies or tax incentives that go to private companies. And um, if those incentives were more aligned with station areas, as has been done in some other places around the country, um, they could uh, start to spur more demand for office space in the station areas. Likewise, the state leases uh, 2.6 million square feet of office space, but not very much of it is transit-oriented right now. And uh, if those lease office leasing decisions could be made more in alignment with transit, uh, that could also encourage developers to build new office space in your station areas. Um, the this, this state is making steps, though, to change this. Um, the, the decisions to locate offices in Constitution Plaza in Hartford, for example, is a great example. It is a great example of that. Um, the state changing its uh, policy in that measure, but obviously there's a lot of room for improvement still. Um, we also encouraged in our report the state to think very broadly about state financial assistance. So. Um, that can come in the form of real estate development subsidies, affordable housing subsidies, tax increment financing, planning grants, um, arts and innovation funds. There's many different pots of money that the state currently um, gives out to uh, various different projects and programs, and targeting those on TOD locations could really help jumpstart your housing um, uh, markets in particular. And we show some examples, uh, though, of how this is being done already. The Capital Region Development Authority is a great example in Hartford of really investing money in building a marketplace for uh, multifamily housing, and it's, and it's succeeding. We, we see a lot of new development proposals happening in downtown Hartford right now. Um, the state recently had put out its uh, qualified allocation plan for the use of low-income housing tax credits. That's one way in which the state decides where those funds go. And right now, TOD locations are given four out of 100 points. That's, that's not a lot of prioritization. Um, tax increment financing, you'll hear a lot more about later, so I'm not going to go into that right now. But it's, it has been done to support TOD in Stamford, Connecticut. Um, the, the TOD pilot grants was a great example of a planning grant that's focused on TOD. And uh, the state's innovation hubs program is another TOD uh, example, uh, but I'll be a very small one that's building the arts and innovation economy. Um, the second major strategy is leveraging anchor institutions. And we're going to look at how anchor institutions, in a little more deeply, can do this, can, um, can support TOD. Um, the state has, in, its, uh, in the transit areas, a fairly large number of anchor institutions. And what we mean by that are hospitals, universities, private colleges, and even community colleges. Um, we show in the map here, uh, the stars indicate major hospitals that are connected to, that will be connected to transit. And the um, circles represent universities and colleges, with the red indicating location, uh, 
institutions that are going to be connected to closely to transit and the blue institutions that are not. Um, and in addition to um, what we're going to look at is how anchor institutions can um, support TAD. Uh, but the other thing that, that the um, influence of transit will do is connect these institutions to other regions. Um, the, putting uh, the rail system in place will connect the Hartford institutions to the New Haven institutions via a rail pass. That's a, that's a huge improvement and that will hopefully create more collaboration between those institutions and build the, the state's research economy. Um, we really look at the fast track corridor actually as being where a lot of these opportunities exist. In this nine mile corridor you have uh, four major anchor institutions that are all going to be connected. Um, Central Connecticut State is the, the state's second largest university behind UConn and it's located within a very short walk of the E Street and Cedar Street um, BRT stations. St. Francis and Hartford Hospital will be connected through special circulator buses and the UConn Health Center will be connected via a special circulator bus. And so thinking about how these institutions growth can support TOD is a really key point that we feel could support uh, growth in the, in the economy that, uh, that leads to TOD in these station areas. Um, and specifically, you see a clustering of biosciences um, institutions here. Uh, you know, Hartford Hospital is a research institution. UConn Health Center has uh, the Jackson Labs coming into it. And you can see the seeds for uh, a real clustering of biosciences that could occur in this ET fast track corridor. Um, uh, and, and I just want to hit on Central Connecticut State specifically because this is a, an ideal, very, very uh, real short term op opportunity to create TOD. This is a plan that uh, Central Connecticut State has prepared for land that it owns literally on the, on the busway. The, the roadway that you see running through the middle of this drawing is the busway. And um, Central Connecticut wants to create 300 student housing units, a new fitness center, a fine arts facility, and a 1,000 space parking garage in this location. And finding a way to make that happen, to have the support for it, will really jumpstart the uh, demand for TOD elsewhere in the corridor because that, it's a huge investment um, that you know, should happen as soon as possible, I think. Um, an example of where anchor institutions have really created TOD, it, uh, an excellent example is the University of Pennsylvania. Um, in uh, the early 2000s, UPenn campus was very hemmed in because it couldn't expand further west because of town gown issues. So instead, they purchased the University of Pennsylvania purchased a huge band of land right along the Schuylkill River, which you see in the far right-hand side, called the Postal Lands. It was former U.S. Postal Service Railway. And um, they've in, done a huge amount of development in that area already, and it's very close to uh, the 30th Street Station, which is all the way up, if you can see the mouse, uh, the 30th Street Station is right here. It's one of the busiest Amtrak stations in the country. Um, and so, some examples of what's happened in this area, uh, driven by UPenn, is uh, a new cancer treatment center, which is called the Roberts Proton Therapy Center, uh, a 350-bed dorm, and a uh, re renovation done by a private company of the post office, which generated about 5,000 jobs, uh, brought 5,000 jobs to that location. And that's really all being spearheaded by UPenn. Um, so we're now going to pivot to what can the station areas, what can municipalities do for their station areas specifically. To get to that point, um, we first created a scatter plot, which you see here, where we took um, measures of uh, market strength and measures of uh, station area urban form and plotted them along the same um, chart to see where the stations all kind of compared against each other. And um, we then categorized those into four categories, uh, which we'll explore further through some case studies. But um, the outreach categories are more suburban, low-density stations with good market conditions. The infill have strong market conditions, and they're more 
higher density. Um, catalyzed stations have higher density but somewhat weaker market conditions. And reposition strategy uh, stations are really have the density characteristics but not a strong enough um, real estate market to encourage new development at this time. Um, and we developed a whole series of strategies. I don't want to go through all of these in depth, but they are in your, the executive summary that was passed out that um, we apply to each of these station area types so that you can look up, OK, you know, uh, my station area falls under this category, and, and the consultants think that these steps are what we should be doing to encourage TOD in our station areas. And we hope this can be a really powerful tool for you. Um, to, to start to understand what you can do. Um, so some case studies to explain these uh, typologies further. First one is an outreach type station, and it's, it's a station but in Arlington County, Virginia. And, um, through uh, intensive master planning during the 1980s, Clarendon positioned itself to later have a huge amount of development as the DC market expanded. Um, they've seen 1.1 million square feet of office space, 500,000 square feet of retail, and 2,300 housing units over the last 30 years in this station area. Um, an infill example from Connecticut here is 360 State Street down in New Haven, which many of you are probably familiar with. And in that location, right next to a train station, um, the city working with a private developer, which they selected through a um, RFP process, has created 450 market rate units and 50 affordable units, as well as a 25,000 square foot cooperative grocery store, which has really transformed downtown New Haven. Um, one example, which I'll go into more detail on before I wrap up, is Metro Green, which uh, my, the company I work for is developing. Um, and in that location, which had a somewhat weaker market when we started, we used an affordable housing first strategy where affordable housing kind of generated investment, laid the groundwork for market rate housing to then follow as that location became more appealing. And the last example of a reposition strategy is another project we've done in Elizabeth, New Jersey, where um, HUD Hope 6 funds really transformed the public housing um, development and laid the groundwork for market rate development that has been followed because it, it really created a whole new um, image of the neighborhood. Um, we also created out of these um, typology recommendations corridor plans like what Sujata was showing you for other regions. These corridor plans are for the rail and the busway. And what they do is they provide in a graphic form our recommendations for how each of these stations fit into the overall corridor. In the rail corridor, we really think of Hartford as being the hub and that many of the other stations will function more as feeder kind of commuter stations. And so a lot of the opportunities in those, um, those locations will be to develop housing for people who want to get to jobs in Hartford. We see the BRT corridor functioning a somewhat different way because there are more jobs located along the entire corridor, so many of the stations could function in a multiple different forms as both feeders and um, destinations. Um, and I just want to conclude with um, some more information about this affordable housing phase strategy because I think it's a really powerful tool for this region. Um, this is our Metro Green Master Plan. And what you see are, uh, there's four residential buildings that we are in the process of creating. The, the Metro Green Apartments at the bottom and Metro Green Residences uh, just to the uh, right of that have both been built and occupied. Um, we build apartments first. And sorry, I should just explain also, um, to the left-hand side are two office buildings. One Metro Center exists, and the other Metro Tower is planned. Um, when we first started working on this property, it was literally and figuratively on the wrong side of the tracks in Stanford. Um, it was a large piece of vacant land right at the train station, but the neighborhood had not seen any, very much investment in it for many, many years. Uh, it was called the South End Neighborhood, mostly industrial. and. Um, 
when we started to analyze the market, we realized that market rate housing just would not work in this location. So we started with um, a first phase, which was metro green apartments. It was 50 affordable units. And it created just a new image for the location. Um, when you drive by it from the outside, you have no idea whether it's affordable or market rate housing or what it is. But it looks nice, and it's new. And it really created uh, a sense in the neighborhood that there was something happening, that you know, this was a new neighborhood that was developing. Um, after the success in that property, we moved on to the second phase, which incorporated 10 market rate units and 40 affordable units. That, uh, that phase is also now completed, and we were able to successfully lease those market rate units because of the success of the first phase in just attracting the market to that location. And we're now planning a third phase, which would have 155 units, 84 of which would be market rate. And this phase would have been a, a unimaginable back in 2008 when we built Metro Green Apartments. Um, but it really shows how, over a very short time, this strategy can transform a neighborhood. And I just want to conclude with what else has happened in the South End neighborhood during the time that we've been developing Metro Green. Um, as you may know, the South End has exploded um, in development. There's been a thousand, over a thousand new units of housing, which are pictured here, a fairway grocer, restaurants and other retail, and multiple Class A office space buildings. Those developments in some way were paved by um, our Metro Green development just establishing a sense of, you know, something was happening here, there was investment occurring, and uh, we think that that strategy could work in many of your towns where the current market conditions might not be strong enough to support market rate development. But if you unlock those markets in the future, and if you have that transit in place, you may see um, what you see here, which is investment growth and expansion. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks uh, both to Sajanta and David for your presentations, and we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we have about a half hour based on our on our schedule, so we'll take as much time as we can up to a half hour for questions. Anyone have a question? Yes, sir. Every successful every successful product introduction has a market analysis supporting it, and so does every successful market uh, product. Introduction. Given the fact that much of what you are showing here is really transformative, uh, how do you develop a market analysis that reliably reflects projections and therefore can really bring together the various parties, particularly financial, that uh, have to make this happen? Sure. Um, I'll try to tackle that one a bit. Um, to start off, in our market analysis, what we tried to do was to balance between assessing what's there now and projecting what could happen in the future um, once the transit is, is um, put in place. So in many of these locations, uh, to be completely honest, the market is not very strong for new development right now. but. For example, that slide that showed latent capacity, we feel that as transit starts to change the nature and the attractiveness of these locations, there is capacity in place for demand to be generated for housing down the line. And it takes a little bit more forward thinking to look at that. Um, and I should say, you know, working for a development company that I've learned in my career that developers are, are pack animals. And you know we follow the success of others, but um, we do feel very strongly that there is capacity in this market um, over the in the in the longer term future for um, demand to be generated for housing development and commercial development in these locations eventually. And it just may take a few first movers for that to be unlocked. Yeah, I, I guess I would just sort of add that even in, you know, kind of this 
we're working at this level, right? So we're not really getting into all the detail that um, individual towns may be planning for certain types of investments or certain types of streetscape improvements or putting some planning in place that actually provides some certainty for developers about what is likely to happen there. So there's certain types of building blocks, I guess, that you can put into place even when the market isn't quite there yet, um, so that when you do have the transit operating and you are drawing from a larger market than just what you have traditionally seen as you know, your half mile radius, um, that you have some of those pieces there to start to build some things. So, you know, I think it's good to, to be um, phased in your thinking about what you can do in the shorter term. And then, you know, once, once development is in place, how can you build on that? And I think David also provided an interesting um, lesson in how certain types of maybe tax exempt or not fiscally, not big fiscal generators can, in the short term, being like a loss leader, but in the long term can really drive big gains um, from a larger perspective. So it's really tough to try to balance the short term stuff with the long term stuff. But I think that, the, that starting first with a really good understanding of what you can do um, in the interim and being kind of incremental, starting to lay down the groundwork is underappreciated, but a really important part of it. Questions? Yes, ma'am. David, I, I wanted to ask um, two things. One is the slide that you showed about the with the wide bars and then the narrow bars between. And I wonder if we could look at that again. I wasn't sure I understood what yeah. that slide depicted. Yeah, I know that's somewhat of a complicated analysis, but I appreciate that you want to go back and go through it in more detail. I think it is very important. I, I think you were trying to make a point about a demand for multifamily housing, but I wasn't sure how the bars in those communities compared. Thank you for going back. There, yeah, that okay. one. Yeah. So what we're seeing here is um, thinking towards the future. What we found in the blue or, I'm sorry, let me start with the red. I think the red is an important, or more important number. The red is the absolute number of households within three miles of each of those stations that could potentially afford a new market rate multifamily unit. And we calculated that by determining what it costs to build market rate multifamily housing and what that would require in terms of a rent. And so what you see, for example, in Hartford is that within three miles of the Hartford Union Station, there's uh, just about 5,000 households who could afford the rent you'd need to cover your cost in a, a unit in Hartford. And um, that represents about 10% of the total households in that three mile radius. So that, that would be how to analyze that data. And when developers underwrite a project, we think of what's called capture rate. So how many people do we need to attract to our development within a three mile area to fill the building? Because our biggest fear is what if we invest all this money and nobody shows up? So if you have 5,000 households and you're building 100 units, you have a very good capture rate because you could, you only have to capture, what is that, less than 1% of the total number of households in that area in order to, um, to fill your building. So if I look at that graph, I see really strong demand um, for market rate housing in Hartford, West Hartford, Springfield, not so much in Windsor Locks, is that right? What it just says is that in Windsor Locks, the scale has to be different. It doesn't say that there's not demand. Um, you still have about 500 households. So you may be talking more about 50 or 25 units versus 100 or 200. And I should just say, it's not, this is not necessarily demand now. It's potential demand in the future. Because we don't know if those 5,000 people want to live in a market rate building 
right now, but if you build one, they may they might want to. I wanted to ask a second question about the Stanford project that you used as an example. Um, you, it, it was exciting to hear that they sort of um, front loaded the affordable housing, and then even the subsequent housing that was built was was mostly affordable units. Um, and I think we're all very aware of the incredible demand for affordable housing in Fairfield County, right, where the housing prices are so extremely high. And I wonder if you see the same kind of dynamic in the corridor for the rail coming from New Haven to Spring, if you see the same kind of, of really strong demand for affordable units. I, that's my perception, and I wonder if you support that. Yeah, I think that the data uh, does support the need for affordable housing in the knowledge corridor, and I think Sujata made the point, which we, we also believe um, and have done some analysis on, which is that transit-oriented locations are really the best places for low-income households to live because they have limited budgets, and the more money that they have to spend on their families and less on transportation to get to their jobs really makes a, a, a vast difference in their lives. And so um, in addition to just the overall demand, we think that from a societal level, it's, it's a good policy to have in place as well. And um, as people offer questions, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Tom Yezuez from the Connecticut Department of Transportation. And I'm going to speak outside my area of expertise here, but actually I'm going to raise a question. I'm concerned by the discussion of what, how people are interpreting the term affordable housing. And I'm wondering if you can give an explanation of that. It does not necessarily mean low-income housing in terms of the guidelines. Yeah, that's a very good point. In um, Metro Green, to give you a, a, a kind of real-world example, um, we have housing that's affordable to households earning 25%, 50%, and 60% of the area median income. In Stanford, the area median income is $115,600. So when you're earning 50% of the area median income, you're earning about $65,000 a year you're not necessarily, um, you have other housing options. You could choose to live somewhere else with that amount of money. And so affordable housing for us functions in a way as um, competitive market rate housing because we do compete with other properties um, to attract those residents. But the real key is that the housing is set up so that the rent cannot exceed 30% of the household's income. And that's the real key, um, it, which is that households are not overburdened by living in our properties. Follow up. Just to follow up on that too, and, and Stephanie Pollock may get to this point later, but uh, it, you need to weave in probably into that discussion the notion of the changing demographics and who these 65% of median income may represent. It's a different market. It may be the young single professionals. If I could just speak to that quickly, um, our tenant demographics at uh, Metro Green is fascinating from that point. We have a huge mix of people. Um, it's almost everybody works at the property and um, Many of our residents are young households, um, a couple who's living together and trying to get established. Um, we have, in some cases, um, students even, you know, a partially student households. You can't do fully student households, but um, we have uh, some retirees. We, we have um, married couples with children. It's a huge variety. Thank you. Uh, Trace Green, Seattle VOA, member of the Zoning Commission in North Haven. Um, I have a question also about Stanford Project. You said that you built the affordable first, 
and then you follow it up with, with the non-affordable units. We just had this issue come up the other night at our zoning meeting. Who buys the units that are non-affordable, um, knowing that the affordable are next door? And our issue was, who's going to pay that much more money for the same exact unit in that area? Uh, what we found um, is that in many cases, people don't care what the person next to them is paying, and, and um, we've the, the people paying the market rate rents for our property uh, pay about twenty two hundred dollars to live in our building. So they have definitely other choices about where to live. They earn pretty high salaries, um, and they want to live at Metro Green because it's got great access to the train. Um, almost all of our market rate uh, residents have some that connection to New York City, which is really key. Um, but we just haven't seen a huge impact from this mixed income issue. Um, and we, we operate mixed income properties uh, elsewhere, and we've not found that to be the case there either, which is that people want to just live in good housing. They, they don't care whether the person next to them earns less or more than them. Question in the back. Um, the lowest rent units are 25% of AMI, um, and they rent at about $500 to $600 a month. And that would be a household earning around 30000 a year. Um, we have uh, 13 of those out of 100 units, so 13%. Question up here. Thank you for your patience with the microphone. We're recording, so it helps. Uh, I'm Mike Flynn with, uh, I did a little bit of work in Stanford. Um, the, the, the Metro Green project has to be looked at in a larger context because, uh, well, it's been successful in the block it's in that you go one block, two blocks further, <clears throat> there's about 4,000 market rate units being produced. So when you look at the marketplace and the brand of affordable in the market, you really find the concentration at Metro Green as opposed to the wider neighborhood. And I think you don't want to get caught up on too much of the affordable making or not making it uh, at that location or other market units within your complex because the bigger picture, literally two or three blocks further out, uh, completely changes the dynamics of how that project sits. Um, the only point I want to make is that it's not a similar entity uh, in that larger context. You know, we get too hung up on the affordable reading the market because I think that market was ready to blow and did. And the affordable was lucky to get in, frankly, at the time we got in. So. Questions? Right back here. Thank you. Uh, again, another, another question regarding affordable. Um, North Haven is at about 4.7%, and we're well below what the, what the state requires for affordable units. Um, I'm just interested in finding out what anybody here thinks of um, maybe the town adapting some sort of regulation or amendment, saying that anybody coming in with a multifamily use will have to give us 10% um, affordable of any units of any, any project that is proposed, because we're, we're looking for some solutions. Anyone have, uh, want to comment on that statement, on the question? Well, I could call it David take us. This is a lot of what the partnership does. Tristan, that's a good question. Um, we were just up in Massachusetts yesterday, and we went to a town, uh, the town of Melrose, which is about 20 minutes north of Boston. Uh, they have a uh, commuter rail there, and they also have an inclusionary zoning ordinance in their town. So 10 percent of all the housing that they create is always affordable. And they do it because they have the same law in Massachusetts that we have here. We have a dash 30 g that requires 10 percent or um, developers can override local zoning. So, yeah, there are towns uh, in New England that make hard about that and make sure uh, and institutionalize within uh, inclusionary zoning regulations to 
make sure that uh, a portion of all the housing they do does that. Darien has such a regulation, Stanford has a regulation like that, and um, you know that's one way of uh, dealing with that issue and providing the housing that you need. Question right here. Actually, to your right. Before I hand it over, I just want to add on to that that the State's Home Connecticut program run by the Office of Policy and Management um, is working with many towns across the state to implement mixed income zoning. We've had a huge amount of towns that are really looking into that and studying it. So there's, you have peers. No, no, we're back here. Yeah. So just one additional comment. Um, the partnership is uh, part of something called the Interagency Council on Affordable, on affordable Housing, which was created uh, to advise the new Department of Housing on policies and practices. Um, we believe that as a matter of public policy, that where particularly there are state dollars involved, whether it's housing trust fund dollars or uh, flex housing dollars, uh, there needs to be uh, in any project that uses state monies a commitment to uh, affordable units. Um, the, I, I will say that uh, there have been two rounds of funding that are now called CHAMP. I don't, can't remember what that stands for. But uh, 14, 1,459 units of housing have been financed uh, with, in, in part with state dollars. Less than half of those units are uh, affordable at or below 80% of AMI, and only six of those units are at 30% or below of AMI. So, from a public policy perspective and using uh, scarce resources, that's not good enough. Questions, Mary Ellen? I'm Mary Ellen Kowalski of the Capital Region Council of Governments. Um, Jada, I wondered if you maybe could just talk a little bit more about the Cleveland Health Line. And what I, I'm i wondering about is um, more of a, I guess, maybe a process question. How was Cleveland successful in really engaging the anchor institutions? And um, I guess also thinking a little bit about kind of who led that process um, in terms of getting them fully involved realizing the benefits of the transit and then making the investments that we're seeing now there. So it was actually a combination of stakeholders. So it wasn't really any one particular lead actor, but there was a, a nonprofit that facilitated a lot of that that was dedicated to the revitalization of University Circle. Um, and I can, I can actually send folks, if they're interested, a full case study that we wrote up on that example that really details the process um, because I don't know it off the top of my head, but what I can say is that the transit agency was one of the leaders because they saw that there was an opportunity to move an existing station, which is a big undertaking, to better connect Case, Case Western to this and make that a part of the transit-oriented development. So one of the lead actors was actually the, the transit planner planning process itself in recognizing that if you don't connect up the employers, it's not really going to have the same level of impact. Um, another kind of, the, another lead was Cleveland Clinic, um, which really saw this health line as being something that would have a positive impact on their operations and their expansion plans and in building cancer hospital and thinking about how they and their employees would really use the BRT as well as the existing stations. So I think, you know, it was, it was, it was, I think, lucky in some ways that the universities and hospitals saw this benefit, but I think that there was a, a lot of political leadership from the city and good planning in place to kind of make sure that those stakeholders were all involved. And, I, you know, I do want to emphasize that it was great to have this nonprofit be like the convener and be kind of the facilitator of making that happen, um, because I, th I think a lot of times UD requires that. And there's sort of a similar structure in the Central Corridor with the Central Corridor's uh, Funders Collaborative, which is a collaborative of philanthropy, 
and stakeholders, community groups that has also kind of facilitated the planning of that corridor and working at that corridor scale um, because it's hard for any one jurisdiction to do that. Um, so it's been kind of one other common theme has been having somebody to hold that role of being the one that convenes these types of conversations and gets the ball rolling. Yes, you're next. Uh, I'm Amanda Kennedy. I'm with Regional Plan Association. I actually have a question. The one's a little bit shorter. Um, but for David, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about this a projection of 9,000 to 12,000 potential multifamily units. Like, who is that market and kind of what time frame are you talking about? And is that for the entire region or is that just along the transit corridor? Um, and for Sujata, um, the, 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 the study showed about the relationship between building type and potential profitability was really interesting and I think new information. Is there a particular report in the bibliography that goes into more of that information in more detail? Um, so actually, I'll answer both of those questions because both of those came from work that we, we did. So the first one was an analysis of potential demand and we used pretty conservative methodology. We actually relied on the region's projections of population and population growth and then we looked at some key household types. So, one thing that was alluded to before was that there's certain types of demographic um, changes that are happening, and including in your region, I think a lot of people have this perception that maybe there's not that same working age population here or single person households and young professionals here as there are in other places. But our analysis showed that there was actually and that that was growing. Um, and some of the graphs that David showed kind of illustrate that. So we looked at those target household segments to generate that number. And the range is a conservative estimate based on kind of the lower end, if you were able to capture kind of a lower percentage and then at the higher end, if there were more strategic efforts in place. Um, and we were looking at both the rail and bus corridors as being the places where you would locate that demand. Uh, obviously, you could go higher than that or you could go lower than that, but it's all pegged to um, how much growth is expected in the region. Does that answer your first question? Uh, it was what, 25 years, a 25 year time frame. Um, and so it's not a huge amount of demand, which is which goes to the point of really concentrating that demand. And this is another reason why I think thinking about the corridor um, in a, you know, not in spreading it all around, but really thinking about what are the locations that'll have the be our best position to capture multifamily housing, and I don't want to conflate multifamily housing with affordable housing. Uh, I think there's plenty of market for market rate multifamily housing in this region based on the analysis that we've done and based on David's feasibility work. Um, so to the, this, your second question about building types, we do have some uh, work that I could, I could point you to. I think the most relevant one uh, would probably be something that we did for a downtown study in Berkeley, California that actually looked at all the costs and revenues at, by building type um, and has it all in kind of a condensed uh, report. But there's also uh, a report called Capturing the Value of Transit that the CTOD did that's about value capture, but underlying that it looks at the economics of development um, and starts to kind of uh, illustrate what some of the considerations are in thinking about densities and how to how to tailor to your context. So I can pass those on to you later. So this makes me think that we've got market demand, but it's just not here in the state right now. That it's elsewhere. And if we had more affordable housing, that our market was under control, not so expensive. And also if we had a bunch of interesting town centers, um, people would come. Because one of the other things I hear from people is that, well, you know, our cities, they're not that exciting right now. And so if we made interesting places and it was affordable, and on the scale of this entire line, I suspect that we could have population growth coming in. And so that might not be measured in the demographics. Right. I think what we're trying to convey is that you have a demographic profile that is very diverse, and yet your housing types are very monolithic. So there's a mismatch in terms of the pr predominance of single-family detached homes and the fact that your households are no longer Aussie and Harriet households. 
problems. So let's think a little bit more broadly. I think what happens in most of the places that I work is that a lot of the people that sit on councils or policymakers uh, can't envision themselves in that place because they're in a different stage of their lives. Um, so they're not thinking, well, I want to live in a 1,000 square foot apartment. Um, therefore, let's not permit that because who wants to live there? I think that they don't understand that different households at different stages in their lives are making different types of decisions and a variety of housing types allows you to retain the workforce, it allows you to retain a broader spectrum of people to work and live here and build their businesses here, start up businesses here, and contribute to the economy, right? So that's really what we were trying to illustrate is that there's this demand for compact, livable types of neighborhoods, but to, to really capture that, you have to be able to allow those diverse housing types to flourish. Yeah, uh, if I could just add one quick thing to that. Um, we also found in research that a lot of the multifamily housing in the region is quite old. And new multifamily housing doesn't necessarily look or function in any of the same way as the housing that was built in you know, the 1970s. And um, that could also, having more new multifamily housing might create you know, new models, new images in people's minds of what multifamily housing can be. One, yeah, we've got 10.35, we can take one or two more. Uh, John Simone with the Connecticut Main Street Center. I just want to follow up with what you were saying, Shelby. You know, I like to think that I'm in the business of helping communities create cool places where people want to come, but I'm seeing all kinds of, especially young people, but I'm seeing all kinds of conflicting studies on what draws young people. I saw one study that said, uh, 60, I'm making these numbers up, but they're in the ballpark. 60% of young adults pick the place they want to live first, then they figure out how to get the job. And I saw another study that said just the opposite. You know, that if there's a job there, they'll come, and then if it's not so cool, maybe they'll help make it cool. So I don't have any really good sense of really, if, you, if you're trying to attract, maybe you could say the same for uh, older adults too, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, who are maybe not worrying about the job end. Um, but if you guys have any more definitive information on, on really what is the first thing you need to do if you're trying to keep or attract young adults. I, I mean, I can, I can try to answer that. Um, I just re reviewed a study by the ULI um, that was interesting. And, it, and it, it just looked at which metropolitan areas are attracting the greatest number of my generation. Um, and it, it's places like New York, Austin, Texas, Denver, Colorado, um, I think Washington, D.C. was on that list. Um, and I think what you see throughout those places is um, not necessarily always job growth, be, going to your point. I mean, New York City as a whole has actually lost jobs, I believe, in the last um, decade. But um, what you see is kind of a, a certain hipness in those places. Um, they're just places that people are talking about that you know are, um, I think, attractive physically and um, societally. Would you? Um, yeah. In terms of data sources, there are uh, there's kind of two ways of looking at it. One is the preference surveys, and that's where you see, well, there's. 20% that want to live near trans transit and 20% that want to live in a single family detached home in the suburbs. And so there's this, maybe there's a split. Uh, and I don't think that we're saying we're going to capture every millennial in a TOD because there's plenty of people who want to live in the, in different places. So I, th I think, um, and then, sorry, so there's that, there's that data set. Um, the second data set that I'm really familiar with is actually, um, you know, I, I like data and I like numbers. So I uh, have actually seen uh, reports from the Department of Transportation on uh, VMT or, you know, vehicle miles traveled and also on driver's licenses by age group. And it's really fascinating to see that young people are not getting their driver's license the minute they turn 16 anymore. It's so interesting. I mean, I live in Berkeley, which is, you know, I live in a transit-oriented place, um, 
And tons of my neighbor's kids who are, you know, 16, 17, 18, their parents are still driving them around. So, you know, you could interpret that as like, okay, kids are lazy, or you could say, there's, they actually have the option to not drive with their friends. So they're not gonna get their driver's license. So I think there's actually some concrete data that shows this. Um, there's also a lot of market responses to that that I'm already seeing. So there's developers who are putting in certain types of amenities into their apartments to capture the, the preferences that different, I mean, I think this is sort of, this is not new. People build to what their market is, but you know, like dog spas because millennials want to treat their dogs like they're their children or um, things, I'm saying this because I'm not a millennial, so. Uh, and and uh, I've, I've also seen a lot of reports about the workplace environment changing in response to people's, you know, I'm sure you all have seen those studies as well. Uh, there's a lot about the Google campus in Chelsea and how they've reconfigured it to be um, really hip and, and cool. But I think that there's some kernel to, there's some reason for that, and I think it's because people are looking for more interaction, the way that they're using social media is different, the way that they think about their jobs is different. A lot of people are more interested in having flexibility in their workplace than how much money they're gonna make now for that generation. So there's enough data there, I think, that if you put the pieces together, you can start to come up with some general conclusions. But I don't think that you should, you know, run away with it either. Very good. Thank you very much, Jata and David. We appreciate your presentation and participation. There's, um, Jata has a, a study or a... Uh, this is just a, a booklet that kind of has some of the information that I presented.